moving up to the podium now are two next speakers. Their bios are in the material, so you could read their formal biographies. Um, this is Maureen Shad, who is now with the firm of Norton Rosen Fulbright. She's a Fulbright scholar. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I'm kidding. Uh, she's a pro bono coordinator for the firm. And um, Maureen and I were once in a meeting where someone said, do you know anything about special immigrant juvenile? And I, I went like this, because what? Uh, 600 I'm cases old. a no, year, no, no. It's just 700, it's I mean, it, it really, I, as long as I have been doing this work, Maureen has almost as well, and she is really one of the most knowledgeable people in the United States, let alone in New York. And next to her is my superhero of the day, uh, Megan Stewart, who's with the Urban <laughs> Justice Center, and all the documents that you see labeled up here, um, Oh, we, I thought we labeled them. Oh, under um, all hers. family true. court related. <laughs> They're labeled Urban Justice Center. Megan keeps many of us educated and informed, constantly updating her materials. But I, I'm going to just say one more thing in her introduction. She is also an inspiring advocate. With firm and direct politeness, she educates her adversaries and the court. And she is someone to be emulated, a fighter for justice. OK. There you go. Your Thank you, Lenny. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, we were, um, I think, not texting while the judge was speaking, but wondering why, uh, what we have left to say, because you've covered so much of it. Um, no, no, I mean, it's, it's hard to follow you, but we wanted to cover a few issues that come up frequently when people, you know, are contacting us for with questions about cases, um, including service, fingerprinting, what we call who's your daddy, <laughs> you know, paternity. I mean, there's a lot of issues about paternity um, and birth certificates and whether a paternity proceeding is necessary and custody proceedings in particular. Um, some tricky issues about guardianships. Um, guardianships when a child is not financially supported by or living with the potential guardian, for example. Um, you turn this over, what else? Special, oh right. <laughs> um, other specific over 18 issues. Um, you know, and I think when we talk about fingerprinting, it's, it's not just fingerprinting and the fact that it's not, you know, not, not required by statute, but also what is happening in the current climate um, and what is the reality of, of enforcement. Um, and we've had some conversations and, we, and we'd like to share some of the results of that with you. Um, some, some thoughts about, you know, our, when we're, working with families and we're trying to also consider um, our clients. When, when I speak about clients, I'm always thinking about um, kids. Frankly, I, you know, I worked at the door for a lot of years and that's, the, that's where I come from. I, I represent youth, that's what I do. Um, so when I say clients, that's usually what I'm thinking about. But if you're working with youth and they wanna protect their parents, who they love, um, even if they've been awful to them. And so you know how, how you work with that. And also some of the issues and special findings right now with the unbelievable um, uptake in RFEs and NOIDs. So, you know, over 85 to 90 percent of cases, particularly for over 18 kids these days, are being RFE'd or, or NOIDed. Um, is that a word? And so Megan and I wanted to talk a little bit about some of those issues. Stephanie is going to cover them from another perspective, but you need to be aware of them as you're entering family court because, you know, you need to craft not just the special findings order, but your pleadings and everything you do from the moment you, you know, even think about entering family court, um, you know, kind of thinking, where are you going? And family court, as we, we all know, is not, for most of our clients, I mean, we're not, we're not going into family court just to obtain an immigration benefit. And we're going because it's all about permanency for youth um, who have been abused, abandoned, or neglected. And that's you know, so that's what it's all about, and it's important that we're constantly working from that framework. And so um, Megan and I, you know, kind of wanted to start there, um, and we'll go through all these things, and we'll take questions as we go or at yeah. the end. Okay. I mean, right, so like if Judge Martino could clone himself and put himself in every borough, <laughs> yeah. in every courtroom, there would be nothing to say right now, because if we know that we're always dealing with, like, a well-informed, open-minded, thought thoughtful judge, we wouldn't have a lot of the issues we're seeing. And, you know, sometimes it's just like judges are busy, caseloads are ginormous, and, you know, sometimes judges are just having a bad day or they're 
misinformed about the law. Like we're some, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm wrong occasionally, <laughs> you know. And so it's just, you know, so a lot of what we're going to talk about is when hearings don't go the way we think it, it should, even by following some of Judge Martino's best practices, which I think are excellent tips. Right. I guess I want to say two quick things before we begin. Um, one, uh, I think three things that Judge, or no, three, three things that Judge Martino said I think were particularly important, um, I guess, for us to repeat as practitioners. One is that this is an unbelievably collaborative community, as you all know or can know. Um, you know, from listservs to just individual calls, I urge you all to reach out, not just to us, but to everyone in the room who makes himself available, because it's it's the way that we, I mean, it's the way that I've literally survived the last um, decade of my life, um, because the my colleagues in the SIG community um, have sustained me. And, and this practice is really hard. I mean, family court is really hard. Um, and there's lists for New York City, there's lists for Long Island, there's lists for um, Westchester and, and counties north. Um, also, you know, that it's, that the supervising judges can't direct outcomes. And we're seeing there are some judges and referees who, frankly, you know, aren't following what we think, um, or, you know, aren't necessarily following the law, right? Um, sometimes, even when we present it to them. And we'll, we're going to urge you now, and continue to urge you, to bring those instances to people's attention because without you um, bringing those to people's attention nothing can change so um, whether it's an affirmation about those instances or appealing your case um, you know complaining about it won't make a difference unless um, we have specifics so you know I just we urge you to do that because there are a lot of incredibly well-intentioned judges, jurists, referees, I mean, out there, and the supervising, supervising judges are doing a great job, but they can't, they can't tell people how to, how to decide their cases, so. Okay. So should we talk about service, which is my That's favorite my thing to talk about, because I feel like I'm a state court practitioner trapped in the body of an immigration law practitioner. Um, and I think this sort of goes back to something else Judge Martino said, is family, you know, SIG cases are odd, they're ex parte, and so service is, in some ways, the, one of the most important things we have to do because it, we have to get jurisdiction. And the judges rightfully should always be concerned that the respondents are getting due process. That's an ex like that's what the law says mm -hmm. they should be concerned with is, I feel like as a lawyer, like I'm concerned that everyone's mm -hmm. getting due process. And so when judges are really stuck on service, I think that's important. But I think it's also important to remember what does the law really say about service and what is reasonable versus what would we all maybe like to have happen in an ideal world and or what like satisfies your process actually yeah you know and and bringing it back to that yeah. yeah so so i think someone brought up the idea of do you have to serve you know the summons and petition does that have to be translated the answer is no absolutely not that no requirement in any statute in any case law, there's some exceptions for some matrimonial when mm -hmm. it comes to publication, but it's not required. And, and though some judges would like that, and it makes sense, right? Like if you're serving a summons and petition on a parent in, let's say, Honduras, who you know only speaks Spanish, yeah, I, I could see why a judge would be concerned that that person be able to read the document. But that's true for all civil court. Not everyone speaks English. Not mm -hmm. everyone is literate. So those concerns are, you know, the... I think the lawmakers who write the CPLR and the legislature who amends it, that those that reality happens all throughout civil court. It's nothing special about family court. And you know, that's not a statutory requirement and that's not a requirement that's been engrafted by case law. Yeah, it's actually and this is a great I, I think this is like a perfect opportunity to remind judges of um, you know, do you require this in your Article 10 cases? No. In Article 10 cases, it's not required that, you know, that the, the, that the documents are translated for a parent who's being accused, you know, quote unquote, of um, neglect or abuse, right? And so, and it's just recently that the court has taken steps to actually translate orders of protection into multiple languages, and that's a huge thing that's just happened. 
And so the fact that that's just happened and it's just the order that's translated, I mean, so it's just reminding judges, like you can't, or it's not reminding judges, but just reminding jurists, you know, there's not special rules just because it's a SIDGE case. It's, it's a guardianship or a custody case, just like all of your other guardianship and custody cases. This is about protecting, and all in your Article 10 cases and your family offense petition cases and all the other cases that you do, and you don't require that in those cases, and therefore it's, you know, there's not some special extra requirement here. And I think that's true for, you know, service of process is one thing, right? Like, how does the court get jurisdiction over a respondent? Like Judge Martino was saying, custody, it's personal jurisdiction unless there's a set of exceptions. And, and for guardianship, the sort of judges can choose what manner of service, but often mail, international mail, is, mm -hmm. is satisfies due process. But then for the uh, service of the motion, it's, it's a different statute, right? That says... 2103, service of motions done by mail. You're done. You don't have to publish that. You don't have to personally serve it. You don't have to like ride it on a bicycle with like a, you know, a cat on your head. Like it's just service by mail. And so they're just remembering when you're in front of the judge and talking about service, what are you talking about serving and what does the law say is required for that document to get to the respondents? So Megan's guide that's on, in the materials called service and family court, who, what, when, where, and why, and how, um, is, fa is, is fabulous. I mean, the, I, the idea is that you should arm yourself with knowledge about the CPLR and the SCPA and knowing exactly what applies when and where, <laughs> and, and being able to recite it and maybe have it printed out and, and, and provide it. There is second department case law that says that once, you know, say a parent has, um, side to consent, for example, in a guardianship case and a waiver of, of service of process that so they don't actually have to be served, the subsequent motion. That, that is second department case law. Um, I personally don't think that's best practice. Like, I'm just gonna say it. Like, do I think, you know, in every, in every case, I think if you can serve it, you probably should, and most judges are going to ask you to. Um, but we also know that many of our clients are, are, have written affidavits in support of their motions that are incredibly detailed and personal and maybe involving, you know, if, particularly with parents who have abused or abandoned or neglected them, which is all of our clients, um, you know, that they might not want their parents to see. So then that second department case law suddenly becomes really important. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's knowing the law and it's knowing the case law and also the statutory law. I'm sorry. Yes, Maureen? She's also named Maureen, yes. <laughs> Um, what about this catch-22? I did a motion to waive service, uh, citing you know, uh, the Circuit Court Procedures Act, <clears throat> I guess case law, I can't really remember. I think it was something that was circulating, and I looked at it carefully. Mm -hmm. I had the affirmation, I had a client, uh, a guardian's affidavit, and a child's affidavit. Mm -hmm. And the response was, I'm not going to waive because abandonment has. Oh, I'm sorry. The scenario was that the, the, the father of the child had so the, abandoned during pregnancy. I don't mean so, to interrupt yeah. you. Was um, is the issue that the jurist was saying that if there was no prior judicial determination of yeah. abandonment, you couldn't? Okay, so first of all, it's not waiving service, as you all know, and I know you know that. Too. We all know that, right? It's service is not necessary, um, and I think it's really important that we all use that language because serve, it's not that we're asking anyone to waive service, right? We're asking them to, to acknowledge that service is not necessary when someone's abandoned. I'm not correcting you. I'm just saying. I, I honestly like this is a point that we were going to cover and I, I don't want to say waving because it sounds like someone's doing you a favor it sounds like someone's making an exception for you and it's not that the statute 17052 says service is not necessary if the infant has been abandoned right so there are some jurists as Maureen is saying that um, claim that they can't follow that particular statute if there hasn't been a prior finding of abandonment by law which is Bizarre, right? Because many of these families haven't been in family court before. This is their first time in family court. Where was that determination supposed to be made except right here before this jurist? And as George Martino said, he might have an inquest on that issue. And that's what most, frankly, that's what most jurists do, right? Um, some might determine it by, by looking at the affidavits, but most would, would hold an inquest. I, I think you just need to, to push it. Yeah. Um, and to push it and push it and push it yeah. and maybe appeal. Yeah, we were setting the yeah. schedule and at that point I thought we should have pushed it. But, no but it's really hard. I know it's, it's really frustrating. 
So that's our code word. For those of you watching for Celia and Credit, it's going to be push it. I like that. We had repeat the question for the mic, and now we have push it. Okay, keep going. You go. Well, I mean, I think this is where it's the tension as advocates is like, what, how far can we push this issue in a case if we're just going to, like, it, what's in the best interest of our client is not always what's in our, what, not always what I want to do yeah. as, like, an advocate who finds misinformation and unfairness, like, just infuriating, right? Like, and so, but I think it's just really educating the judge that that's impossible. You, you described it as a catch-22. You have to have a prior finding of abandonment, but you have to somehow serve someone who's unservable. That's never going to happen. And so just, you know, maybe pushing the judge and say, is it that or just make an order saying denying the motion for an actual reason. Like Judge Hoffman in Manhattan used to not waive service, and he would have like a standard order with his logic about how, about why he wouldn't do that, which is great, because that's appealable if you want to appeal it. Currently, the US Postal Service is not delivering mail in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. So I had to serve a motion, and I sent it Global Express, and it cost me $120. Um, I doubt I'll ever get that back from my client. Is the fact that you cannot send a regular mail a reason that judges will accept? That's interesting. You know, I mean, we've talked about this a lot in, in various contexts. There's not, as, as far as I know, there isn't case law that directly addresses this issue. That said, I've seen it happen in case by case. You know, so I, I don't have a published case, for example, but I've, I've had cases where judges accept other things. Like that's where Facebook, I mean, that's where the total, that's where you look at the CPLR and, and also you look at case law that talks about right. Facebook and, service and or think, email service, right? And this goes back to what Judge Martinez right. said, right, where you'd maybe do guardianship instead of custody, custody. You know, you can get alternate forms of service, but you have to show due diligence. It's like mm -hmm. a slightly more burdensome process. Mm -hmm. But for guardianship, you can say to the judge, hey, my client, you know, the parents live in Sudan. Postal service isn't going there. There's no FedEx location. Go through that and say, but here's an option. What about Facebook? What about email? You know, what about... WhatsApp, I don't, Snapchat, mm -hmm. I don't, the things, the social media things, right? Like there's, there's other ways You're to. You're pretending you don't use them. No, I don't. <laughs> um, you know, just, just really thinking about if the judge is insisting on service, mm -hmm. how can, how can that get done without mail? Right. And there is, I mean, there's actual, you know, there's really great case law and it's, it's a lot of it's in the family offense or in the matrimonial context, in a lot of different contexts, but um, on email service, on Facebook service, on other, you know, and it's in Megan's awesome guide. Yes? So regarding some judges who, who have been put, this is regarding, um, this is regarding the 1705 and the prior mm -hmm. determination. Regarding the judges that have been pushed, and by the way, there has been an appeal on it that the appellate division dug the issue, what would you suggest you say to these judges? Well, as far as I know, I mean, I'll just be honest, I don't know of many judges who do this outside of Queens. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I think we need affirmations from practitioners that are, are clear about this issue. And I've been asked, I mean, I've been saying this, I feel like I'm a broken record. <laughs> I've been saying this for years. Sorry, the question, the problem is when we've already, you know, pushed and pushed on this issue of there needs to be a prior finding of abandonment in order to even use SCPA 17052, which says that service is not necessary when a parent has abandoned the infant. What should we do? And I'm saying, you know, as, as we've, we've, you know, the supervising judge can't do anything without specific examples. Um, and specific, specific examples have to be detailed. Oh, and I would love Judge, Mart <laughs> judge Martino's ideas on this. Yes. Well, I mean, my idea is just like any other issue in the law, you have to appeal. If the highest court then directs us and says, no, there's no such requirement under the law, then it's really beyond any individual judgment. Now it's following what the highest court does. So that's much more effective, I think, than, than the affirmation. Mm. The oh, yeah, yeah. Theory. That's yeah. the best. That way, Definitely. I guess we just need, we need another direct appeal, right. you know, another on point appeal. I, I hear you. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard too, right? Like, but I, I agree. Yeah. Unfortunately, it probably doesn't go the other way. 
No, I agree. I mean, that's what I meant to, I mean, no, I, yes, thank you, Your Honor. I mean, appeals are the way that we've, we've created over the last 10 years, an amazing body of case law in New York. Yeah. The, one of the uh, guides is just like a, a guide to all of the appellate yeah. case law related to Sage, which is, I think now like almost 20 pages. When I started doing the guides in 2012, it was one, one page. There was like seven cases. And now we have a number of really excellent decisions about all of these topics we're talking about. But then, you know, if your judge isn't going to follow the law, then it is appealing. But it's hard. Like, for me, my clients are all 19, 20, and we just don't have time to appeal. And so... Well, I know. And that's where, and that, that's where, I, I, that's where the affirmations come in. Yeah. But, you know, and that's an issue, right? So many of us work in, in practices where um, the, entire, the entire, like, office only takes cases. So the door, for example, for a period of time was only taking cases and still does, right? 20 and a half and older because there's such a long waiting list. So the judges are, of course, understandably like, why are you always bringing me kids who are about to age out? But it's like, because every single kid that we intake, or every single kid we take is, is, eight, is weeks away from age out. I mean, we did, we've, you know, I, I, my first cases were always three days a week, two weeks from age out. And um, those of you who have interned with me know that because I made you do them. All. But, um, you know, so I think it's, it's hard in those cases, but that's where the affirmations go. Sam, I'm sorry. So, um, sending this, I think it's the sixth bullet point. Yes. For consent. Well, I sent that to a parent in El Salvador who was um, willing to consent. She agreed by phone. They act like a teacher. They, they both agreed by phone that they would do that. Great. But the issue is the difference between a notary public here that costs $2 and mm -hmm. the mortality of it. Yeah. It cost $100. Yeah, I. Megan has a really uh, sure. The question is. before before you answer, I need to repeat the no, question because I'm seeing Lenny. No, oh, you no, go. No, you go. The question was if you know um, uh, when someone's willing to consent, but the difference between a notary and a notario, and and what is a what is a notary in another country? What what satisfies the requirement? Megan. Yeah. So now, <laughs> uh, in a guide that now with Judge Martino, I'm embarrassed to say the name of, which is Family Court. That's not a thing, Your Honor. One of the things that's not a thing is that uh, consents from abroad require a notary. That's actually not, that's not a thing. And the CPLR has a provision, 4538, which says that for any it's sort that, of... It's in her thing. Don't worry. It's in my <laughs> thing. But it basically, there's a statement that the, the signatory can affirm under the penalties of perjury and under the laws of the state of New York that everything is true. But none of the state, the state of New York. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. it has to be outside the, the U.S. Oh, no, outside of New York. You're right. And it can't be any, any, any territories. So, I mean, so one thing that people have done, for example, is have, um, you know, is have people say, I'm a witness. So it's like, you know, and also take a photo of the ID and say, you know, oh, these are two witnesses and here's her fingerprint and here's her ID and here's my ID and I'm a lawyer or I'm not a lawyer. I'm, I'm the town commissioner. But the more, you know, just the more information you give, I think, at least in my experience, even, even judges who have insisted upon very particular requirements like notarization and then, you know, apostilles mm -hmm. where they're not, you know, and Hague Convention where it's not actually required. Once we had a copy of the person's ID and a copy of the notary's ID or the witness's ID and a statement as to who they were, um, were really, you know, it, the point was they wanted to know it was really the person signing. That's really all they wanted to know. So once there was, you know, they wanted to be assured the due process was satisfied. It goes back to what Megan was saying, I think, before. And so it, once we could show the due process was, in fact, satisfied, that this parent knowingly consented and it was, in fact, the parent and it was in their language, I mean, that's the one thing that does have to be translated is the consent, right? I mean, the consent does have to be translated. A, a person in a foreign country signing an English language, language consent is not usually going to be seen as a knowing consent. So, but um, yeah, I think, and then returning to- Yeah, I said that it's, sorry, it's CPLR <laughs> 2106 is where that provision is. And so what we do in those cases is we have the consent, we have that statement on the bottom, we send it in only in Spanish for us as the most typical language. And then when it comes back, we have our translator just affirm uh, again, under the provisions of CPLR, not just saying I'm fluent, but stating some qualification, which is required by the law, that the translations are the same, and we submit the signed Spanish version and the English translation that is unsigned. Okay. Do you think we're done with this?
Yeah. Are we done with service? Did anyone ever? We're going to move on from service unless there's any questions. I just wanted to mention it was a NASA case, so we have a queen of them now. Uh oh. Okay. You know, it's funny that judges are concerned with that because it's from, right, the SCPA, which is outside of, you know, when we do guardianships in family court, it's all in surrogates court. And there's, in those cases, when you're talking about, like, a kid whose parents have died and you're also talking about real property, there's not this, pro it, no those are also that. cases where there is no prior finding of abandonment, right? Like, no one's made this prior finding and then you have a four-year-old who has no parents. Like, that's just not the reality of those cases mm -hmm. either. And, and everything's so, on the papers. And everything, much. yeah, it's just. <laughs> it's pretty silly. Like, there's no situation that that happens. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, so maybe I could just interject for a second. Um, so we'll make a code word surrogate. Uh, retired judge Chris Glenn, who was a surrogate, um, I'm actually perhaps going to work with her to try to do an expert opinion about how the surrogate's court would traditionally look at that, that you didn't need to find a prior finding of abandonment for that issue. So I think some of us who are in the nonprofit SIG provider meetings know that um, in order to help ameliorate some of these issues, we're thinking about finding some uh, standard affidavits that might be submitted in the immigration context, particularly where we're allowed to use affidavits to explain and contextualize information. And maybe it would also help in some of this practice. Yeah, I mean, okay, this is so the kind of thing that advisory surrogate. council could help with. Um, so fingerprints. So I, just one thing before we oh, get yeah. into sort of the mechanics of like why fingerprinting can be very, very dangerous for many of our clients and their family members and friends is if, and you know, again, as Judge Martinez said, not required by the statute, but if a judge is really insisting, there is one sort of like semi way to try to satisfy a judge's concern about criminal history without doing prints mm -hmm. and the office of court administration on their website you can do a criminal history search at sixty five dollars and it's an exact match you have to get the exact spelling and the exact date of birth right and it's a re uncertified report of all convictions for felony un for all unsealed felonies and misdemeanors it doesn't include violations it doesn't include youthful offender adjudications it doesn't include things that have been dismissed and sealed but it shows all actual convictions and in the past I've done that especially for age outs with a judge that I know really cares about mm -hmm. fingerprints but a household member won't come in or there's some other issue where it was unsafe for them to get printed maybe they didn't have ID and, and that's been accepted I don't know if judges are able to run that on their own their own special system they've always asked I mean so to me like that's not an aside that's every to me that's everything right like finding ways to satisfy you know a judge's concern about criminal history of the proposed guardian and it could be by that and like I, I do this in a lot of, I've done that in a ton of cases I've never had a judge suggest that they could do it themselves um, because what they've at least what I understand is that what um, judges have access to <laughs> without special you know is the DV bit database and the um, orders the orders of protection yeah so um, yeah go ahead so would it be adequate to do the FBI that we use sometimes in immigration to show that there's no criminal. Right. Well, so there's, so here's the thing, right? So what, I guess, where the fingerprint thing starts is the fact that you all, as you all know, there is no requirement for fingerprinting in the Family Court Act under, um, or in the Surrogate Court Procedure Act. The Surrogate Court Procedure Act says that fingerprinting is required in permanent guardianship, which is 661B, I'm sorry, yeah, which is not 661A, Guardian, um, guardianships, and you know there was a lot of confusion about that. But permanent, permanent guardianships are generally where both parents are deceased and a child, and or a child has been placed in the care and custody of an, an agency. They're not guardianships where an individual is going in and seeking um, a guardianship of the person order, right? So. Um, Can I just so sure. there's a, a brief mini memo that was taken from a bunch mm -hmm. of advocates in that that's not a thing guide about the sort of statutory the legislative history of but it's also in the advisory it's in, and the, it's in the advisory the, yeah, council yeah. yeah I mean I, I say that because it's it's in something from the OCA which is is that more important than something from me I don't know no it's not it's not with whatever comes from against <laughs> yeah. um, so I actually feel Unfortunately, the provision only said the guardian did not need to be fingerprinted. In my case, and I'm willing to give anybody an affirmation, there was another adult in the household. 
Right, but I mean, but I think, but I mean, I think the important thing, what you're saying, it doesn't, apart from your appeal, the law is clear that no one has to be fingerprinted. And right. I, that is how judges have understood it. But this, these, these two, they're, they're a pair of appellate divisions because if you read them, it says only the guardian does not need to be fingerprinted. There was another adult in the household. Yeah, no, I mean, I hear, I hear you, but no, I hear you, and that's unfortunate in that particular case, but in, in our experience as practitioners, I've never had someone make the argument that, well, Guardian doesn't have to be printed, but everyone else does. I Judges, have. okay, well, I, yeah. In any event, um, the law says that no one has to be printed, and I think the important thing is that we understand where judges are coming from if they want anyone to be printed, which is that they want the child to be safe, which is what Judge Martina was talking about, right? Um, and how can we help them feel better about it? Um, we can help them with the testimony of a guardian and potential others in the household, and that's something that satisfied judges, in my experience, in every county, every borough of New York City, in Nassau and Suffolk and Westchester, um, in Ulster, in Rockland. So, I, you know, it's, it's happened every, like, I've seen it happen everywhere. Um, that's just testimony. No, no fingerprinting of certain individuals who just refuse to be printed. Some people were printed, some weren't. Um, FBI print, FBI, you know, results. Um, I think the hard part yeah. about that is that what is triggering a lot of this enforcement action that, you know, people are hearing about in courts is, like, when the prints are run and it goes to the FBI, which is where, like, prior ICE contact and mm -hmm. removals is, like, that's where those hits are coming back and that's what's causing a lot of Right. These. So that's what we wanted to address. Like, what's yeah. the reality of when right. it? But if when you already print. have the results, or if you're not an alien and you're the guardian. Like, right, right. Right. So I guess like what we wanted to address with with you all is that there are a few different situations in which it's really risky for someone to be in court testifying, in which it's really risky for someone to be printed, right? And that's where someone has an open warrant, number one, <laughs> an open criminal warrant. Um, it's really risky in some boroughs for them to be even in court testifying to their criminal history because um, a judge in Suffolk, for example, has called officers to come and arrest someone with an open warrant when that came up. Um, it is a known risk if someone has actually been deported. So if actually someone has a removal order, been deported for criminal reasons, and has re-entered, that person should not be printed <laughs> um, because there is an automatic flag. If, so, and that's New York State prints, that's any prints. And that's when someone has actually been removed. Okay. And that's the only time where there is an automatic flag is if someone's actually been removed and then they re-enter. Um, Could you explain that? You mean put on a plane? Yeah. Well, you could be removed in other ways, but. They, are, they, they receive a, an order and then they are actually removed. So not just they have a, an outstanding order and they're living here with that final order. We don't know if that, so, or we do know that, we do know that that doesn't automatically result the same way in a red flag, the way that being removed does. Once you are removed, there's a red flag. So if you've re-entered and you're here, that's, that's really bad if you, if you get printed. <laughs> Well, it's not even that. It's just that it's just that there's. I mean, it's it's not that. It's just that then you're 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 flagged, and then ICE. It's not. It's not even that it's a crime. It's that then ICE knows that you've you've reentered. For that particular and then, crime, there's like this flag to ICE. Right, but it's not even about the crime. I mean, it's it is, but it's about the reentry that makes you immediately picked up. Able so, to be picked up by ICE. I mean, it doesn't matter. Like the sort of criminal aspect of it doesn't really matter. Well, yes. it says for your counseling purpose, though. That uh, I think you. Well, it matters because you're going to be picked up by ICE. Yes, but it, it's forty percent <laughs> of all removal orders are what are called reinstatements. Forty percent. So um, people who are removed and they're flagged, they're flagged themselves, and if they are then picked up by ICE, they don't have to necessarily have any additional process unless they can establish what's called a reasonable fear level for a claim of asylum or against convention against torture. So mm. it is, I think, in your counseling to know that there's an immigration consequence. It's not everyone here is an immigration law. Sure. No, I, I, just, I think anyone doesn't want to be, I mean, I think you want to counsel anyone. They don't want to be picked up and put in. And I, I'm just going to make a right? side note about <laughs> ethics. I think this is also where it can get really tricky and like yeah. really just being clear who your client is. And if you think your guardian has these issues, just referring them out to get independent 
counsel about the guardianship because this is a moment where there could be a conflict between right. yeah that's all right the rea point. not necessarily the desires of your guardian and your and your client my clients are also always the the young people but you know a functional conflict where client needs special finding order guardian it's too risky to get printed and, and what do you do there just being clear like yeah what information what information, how you're sharing information with that party. Yeah, and I guess the reason I was like, the reason I was saying like, it is because the reason I was saying it doesn't really matter is is kind of for that reason. It's it's just, I, I don't mean it doesn't matter, Lenny, obviously it matters, right? But, but so few people are able to adequately, I mean, so few of us, I mean, maybe, maybe more of you than me, but it's really complicated, right? And so a lot of times we're talking about family law. We're talking about representing a client in family court. And we're not, it's, it's, this is like the most complex immigration procedure. So I just think like knowing, I just wanted everyone in the room to know that this will like get your client picked up by ICE is, is kind of like <laughs> basic, you know. Yeah. I just want to clarify this. These are fingerprints from the family court or for the family court. Mm -hmm. And somebody who has been deported and returned and yeah, anyone so who's been way, deported will be flagged. Because this is how it works. When you get fingerprinted in the family court, right, like you're in Brooklyn, you go to that first floor, they take your electronic prints. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. Anyone who's been deported for a criminal, a criminal reason yeah. will be flagged. So what those prints are electronically sent up to DCJS in Albany. Albany then runs those prints against a number of databases, New York State, you know, Criminal Justice Services, FBI. I think they do like this other interstate warrant yeah. hoo-ha. They get all of that back. Like um, we've seen this with clients on their criminal rap sheets. It has you know all their New York state arrests, and then there's this whole other section with like the F it's essentially the FBI report that shows the date of apprehension, the the charge on the NTA, when they were removed, and then yeah. if you know it's it shows all of that. So for people. So DC, I mean, I guess the easiest way, the simplest way is DCJS, which is where your prints go, right, to New York State, they have a banner for a deported alien. A deported alien is someone who was previously deported, not just ordered removed, right? So someone who was actually deported and previously convicted of any New York offense for which they were fingerprinted. Okay? I just, it's really important because I feel like this is like the biggest question for people is, um, now, that's what we know is flagged and like where people are gonna actually make a phone call. Like they actively make a phone call to ICE. There's, we don't know, and, and what we don't have control over is like all the other stuff that Megan's talking about, right? Like an officer, if they see anything, can call, they could call ICE. And I think another thing <laughs> we don't know is like what is ICE doing mm -hmm. with their time? Are they like, finding out what hits are with the FBI database. Like, mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't know. We know in some contexts, especially when ICE was still at Rikers, that they're looking at everyone's rap sheet and right. you know, finding people who have prior removal orders and trying to reinstate them or if, you know, do institute re illegal reentry, whatever they're trying to do with those people. We know that some officers are doing that, but what we don't know is in the future is officers feel more emboldened to do these things. Like, are we gonna see that in the family court? We don't know that. What we do know now is who so is that's what's being been told to us by DCJS. No, I think like the takeaway is both what we know, so that you can. It's it's both about advising people about like the crazy fear, but it's also about advising people kind of about the not so crazy, like what not to be crazy fearful of, right? Not every undocumented individual, when they get printed in the family court, is getting like a, some report sent to ICE. That's not happening, right? Um, does that mean you can tell your clients there's no risk? No. Does that mean you can tell a guardian there's no risk? As Megan said, that's like a huge conflict of interest. No. <laughs> but so what, what I think the takeaway from us is, is how do you satisfy a judge's desire for more information? So since fingerprints aren't such a, like required by statute, you need to be armed with the statutory you know, explanation, which you can find in Megan's guide and also in the advisory council memo. Um, and then you also need to, you know, have alternative ways to satisfy the judge's concerns, which may be testimony, which may be writing, you know, finding, getting your own um, printout, which may be the child's testimony. So when I say testimony the first time, I mean of the person who won't be printed, but also the child's testimony. Um, I'm 20. I, I don't live with this person. I've never been to their home. I only meet them at McDonald's. 
or I only meet them at church. And that's where this, the Pell you know? case law is really handy. Yeah. Because one of the cases is basically like, what is the point mm -hmm. of the, you know, I think it's Maria CR. Like, what is the point of doing prints? If, especially for a 20 year old, they're already living together. It's not changing anything. And in some mm -hmm. ways, I think, you know, some concern about younger kids being trafficked. I think who traffics young people into sex work is maybe more commonly family members than strangers is like a lot of really sad, sad. reports yeah. show. But, you know, like just really trying to address, like, are, is a client already safe? Is denying a guardianship because there's no prince going to change that child's safety? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. And I think that's it. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, home study to cure any um, concerns. Um, advise them to get their own counsel. <coughs> they did, um, but counsel might not be aware of immigration consequences, and it turns out that this person has a re-entry after the deportation. So they've been printed. They, they, they've been printed. We should probably talk off <laughs> line. I mean, honestly, right? Without any criminal history? Okay, the question was, what is the risk of an undocumented guardian being arrested outside the courtroom? And I said, <laughs> do they have any criminal history? Um, there have been a lot of reports, right? Yeah, I mean, I think- Around, oh, sorry, go no, ahead. No. no, you go. I was gonna say, I feel like this is also a good time to plug the Immigrant Defense Project, setting up for their mailing list, who puts out really excellent mm -hmm. practice advisories, and really, with NYCLU and Maureen, doing a lot of information gathering to figure out what these risks are because what we thought the risks were one year ago are really different than mm -hmm. what the risks seem to be now. And I right. think it goes back to what is that guardian's immigration yeah. history because if someone's completely undocumented, had no contact with ICE, there's going to be no match. There's going to be no hit in the system. And so that if ICE is combing through every hit, they might say like, oh, hey, this name, I don't, it's not, not, you know, they could do some of their own investigation, but the reality is if they're completely undocumented with no previous criminal contact, those risks right now feel very low. Particularly in New York, right? I mean, right. so the, the examples that we've seen across the nation are people with prior removal orders that ICE knows about, and they're, they are, they're going through criminal, they're going through, in New York, criminal court um, dockets. dockets, thank you. Um, they're being provided to them. But that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about family court. Family court is not currently, as, as far as we know, providing their dockets in New York. But that said, the priorities are still not just every undocumented individual. Most of the examples that we know are people with criminal history, someone who's abused. But, but we also have examples of people whose abuser has just called ice on them. And we know, we know that's true. So, I mean, can you ever tell anyone that it's completely safe to go to court? No. Um, but the examples, and they're, and they're pretty much, I think, have been widely reported across the country. I mean, they're, you know, where, where this has happened. Um, it's mostly been abusers calling ICE on, on, on their ex-partners, um, or people with prior criminal history, or people with prior removal orders. So, um, oh yeah, go ahead. I'm so, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Do you, like, stay within your to what extent can you have conversations with household members and guardians about the potential consequences of your prison? Because yeah, I, think it's I don't have anyone to refer. Right. Like, I mean, I could tell them to get their own attorney, but it's highly unlikely. It's a great question. So I, the question was, to what extent can you ethically you know, even advise other household members or even the guardian, if you're representing a child, about immigration consequences? I, you know, I think um, the easiest answer is, Places like 
you know, is, is, is contacting a place like IDP. There are, there are actual hotlines that, that individuals can call as well. Um, and if an individual calls IDP, they will direct them to other places. Um, but go ahead. I, I think that for me, that ethical line is the difference between advice and information. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I can give advice to an unrepresented party when I'm representing, I mean, in general, I think it can't give legal advice to an unrepresented <laughs> party. Um, but especially if you are also representing someone who potentially has an uh, adverse interest. But I think giving someone information is always ethical. And I think, you know, the activist part of me thinks that I should always be sharing information with people. Like, we have access to a wealth of information mm -hmm. that our clients don't have. They have access to a wealth of information that we don't have by, like, their lived experiences. And so just sharing information, I always feel like, is, is ethical. never needs to be a potential conflict. If you're representing the child and you stick with the child, you get a council assigned to represent that adult and you could be the conduit. No, I think the else. comment though was about all the under all the other household members who aren't actually parties. And they can't be they can't get representation in court. Yeah, like in Nassau, like so where she practices um, they can't get they can't get counsel and she doesn't have access to so, but I, I, I think what you're saying is really important. You know, we, we sometimes resist the mother getting appointed an 18B or something like that, right? But I think, you know, what, you know, what she was saying and, and you know, um, working at a place like Carison where she does, like, you know, where, where they're like one of very few on Long Island. So I think it's, um, and 18Bs can be assigned no doubt to a non-represented guardian, but not to all the other household members who have questions about, you know, do I say I'm a household member? Do I get printed? That kind of thing. And that that is, um, that's also where I think information, I mean, there's places though, like Make the Road and, you know, Carison's other offices where, where information safe passage, you know, like where there's other information, Toro, you know, where maybe information can be obtained, even if not legal counsel. I'm hope I'm hoping I'm hoping. Okay, so we need we have very few time. Okay, I just very, want to okay. throw in one ethical standard. I mean, when, I'm, <laughs> when I'm teaching this, I usually say, remember that the ethical standard too is would a person reasonably believe that you were representing them? Mm. And so since we have maybe some cultural difference or language differences, you really probably need to be particularly careful even sharing information. If that person would reasonably believe, believe that you were their counsel too, the lawyer said, uh, you may even need to want to have them disclaim it in writing and carefully explain it. So just protecting yourself so that you can live to serve another hundred children another day. Um, but I am kind of on the activist side as well. And something that I have this fantasy about that maybe I can get us to do is make some videos that would be available on demand that are generic advice and keep them current so that you could say, well, I can't answer that question, but there are some videos. Mm -hmm. Not so much for gardens, but Atlas DIY has mm -hmm. some videos that are that their uh, mm -hmm. co-op members made about the process that maybe isn't exactly for guardians, but is also a good resource, I think. Yeah, in and, and IDP sharing. is coming out with an advisory on this particular issue very soon. Um, we really quickly wanted to address, oh, sorry, we'll take your question in one second. We wanted to quickly address three things. One is um, paternity and some other guardianship and over 18 issues in our final minutes. I'm sorry, what was your question? Um, so it's really just like, if the um, potential guardian other household members have already been fingerprinted when the child moves into their custody through ORR, that give any type of no <laughs> so the question was like what 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 impact does the fact that many you know potential guardians may have been printed well, no I shouldn't have said no so quickly but I, I think your question's a really good one because it's something that's not just a, so okay the question was what impact does that have the, the fingerprinting that was done when someone was released to an OR sponsor um, judges ask us all the time I think we ask it all the time and actually like sponsors ask it all the time, like, no, I was printed. Why don't I get printed again? Um, I guess the first answer is we don't have those results. They're nowhere except in ORR's files, right? And we don't generally ISIS have files. all of what? You said in ISIS files. <laughs> right. No, in ICS. Yes. <laughs> ICE has them as well. But we don't generally have our access to our, entire, our client's entire ORR file. Um, and if we want it, it takes a very long time to get it. Um, two is... 
you know, that it's, well, so we also don't want to turn over the whole OR, OR file to a court because it's, there's a lot of stuff in there that's, you know, it's private and, and we have no idea, we, you know, we'd want to review it and a lot of it's not, a lot of it's hearsay, a lot of it's But I think what you could use, like the way you could spin that for a judge is say, judge, yes. you know, ORR, who's this lovely, wonderful agency <laughs> who only cares about the health and safety of immigrant children, <coughs> lies, um, release this young person to this guardian. They, you know, their child, lie. I would, their child welfare yes. people, and they made this decision, and, you know, it's hard to say, it's hard to give them respect, <laughs> but you could spin it as, you know, the lie of ORR is that they help children. And I mean, they this were printed to be released. And so that this clearly, was deemed yeah. to be a safe placement. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the other thing is that we don't, the issue is that many potential guardians are not the ORR sponsor, right? So um, this, is, this is something that's actually been a, a bit of an issue. You know, many judges ask, like, are you the ORR sponsor? If not, why, why are you petitioning to be a guardian? Like, you can't be a guardian if you're not the ORR sponsor. And the truth is that we know, it, just like you said, today's happy family is tomorrow's unhappy family. That's not the reality of most of the youth we work with. And I think this leads into the next issue. Of yes. Like, you know, <laughs> the, the reality, I think, for our clients yeah. of 18, 19 year old, older, older teens, is that it's not going to be necessarily mom petitioning for a young child as a guardian. They have this lovely relationship. It's way more complicated. Older teens are older teens, and young people used to not being parented have a hard time being parented, and there's often overcrowding. There's many reasons why our clients, many excellent reasons why our clients don't live with their guardian. And so when that's the case, how do you, and judges have concerns about that, like how do you address that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Matter of Axel is a great second department case. I don't think I saw Priya here, but, no. um, and it's not just that it's a great case, but it's a great case because it's one of many cases, but it's, it's, a, it's one of, it's a recent case where the guardian did not live, I'm sorry, the child did not live with the guardian. Um, a 20 year old did not live with the guardian. The guardian was a, a former high school teacher. Um, the guardian also didn't provide any financial support, but the guardian was incredibly supportive, was the person who helped this child when he became a parent, a teen parent, and his and the child's mother, you know, continue in school, was the person who, you know, was willing to say in court, if you become homeless, I will give you a place to stay. If you become destitute, I will give you money. But he wasn't giving him money. And he lived in he lived in Pearl River, I think, or somewhere in you know near Nyack. And the child was in the Bronx or somewhere else in the city. Um, and so the I guess the point is, you know, they lived a reasonable distance from one another, not together, but it's a really, I think it's a really important case and it's, and the facts aren't all in the second department decision, but, um, but Priya from Lutheran Social Services, is that the correct agency, um, has offered um, her affirmation about the facts to supplement any, anything you might need to do, but there are many, many cases like that. And I think it's really important to remember that many guardians are, the, the idea of an adult standing up for a child who's been abandoned, abused, and, and left alone by every adult in their life, just the fact that someone's willing to stand up, even if it is a week before their 21st birthday, and say, I will support you, is huge. And I think it's for us to leave that out of our, of our arguments, you know, the emotional impact of, is, is, is a, would, would be a loss to the case. Because it's the, really big. And at the end of the day, right, the standard is best interest. Is mm -hmm. what's in the best interest of this child. It's not like how much money does his guardian give? Do they live together? Because I think the reality of that is that precludes many, many low-income New Yorkers mm -hmm. from being a guardian or being a custodian if that were the standard. And that's not that's not how the family court functions. That you know they're much more tuned to issues of of class mm -hmm. than than that. Yeah. Yes. Is the implication of that case in the? It's in the case law guide. Yeah. Matter it's of matter Axel, A-X-E-L. -E I'm sorry, I don't have the exact citation on me. Um, and the guardianship statute, you know, as Megan said, is, is sort of where this comes from, right? And matter of steward, you know, it's best interest. But it, I mean, it first has to be extraordinary circumstances, of course, if it's a non-parent, but that's sort of separate. Then the standard is, is this guardianship in the best interest of the child once you've established the extraordinary circumstances? Um, so that and the over 18 issues, you know, do you want to? So some reps, guess which borough, um, really say they can't find abuse, abandonment, and neglect for someone who's over 18, even when that abuse, abandonment, and neglect happened when the, the young person was under 18. And so how do you, 
address that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the reality, like the, the counter argument is like literally every single appellate decision, the, you know, the vast majority of them, the young people were over 18, mm -hmm. under 21, and the appellate department found they, and in many cases, when they reverse lower court decisions, they issue their own special finding order. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually pretty rare when that doesn't happen. And so the, the reality is that's not a requirement that the appellate division has. There's no requirement in statute that you can only make a finding before someone turns 18, whether or not that abuse or abandonment had to happen before right. that point, that's sort of a separate issue, but that that's just not a thing. Right, because the idea, again, is that we're not, we're not asking a court to make an Article 10 finding. We're asking the court to say that reunification in this particular moment is not viable based on something that happened in the past. Um, and that thing is, you know, uh, is abuse, abandonment, or neglect, or qualifies as such, or the facts are, are such that they fit the standard that is neglect under the Family Court Act. You know, of New York, that and that's sort of the reasoning, and that the family, and as you know, Megan said, the the second department case law is clear. Trudy Ann, days before her twenty first birthday, um, you know, every other case, that's all in the case law. <laughs> um, yes, ma'am. So the same judge who has um, sort of abused the um, the seventeen oh five subsection two on the one hand mm -hmm. has a very interesting argument on the other, and that is four thirteen of the Family Court Act. Mm -hmm. And parents are supposed to support their kids until the age of 21. Yes. And the first time I read it, I didn't see abandonment. I think that's a fourth prong. But I had never heard of that until he brought it up. And well, I, I, I think the problem is, so the question, or I don't know. I'm sorry. Do you, the so question? I was responding to the age 18 and all that. Yeah. And 413 gets over that because it's up to the age of 21. Right. So what Merrill is saying is that, you know, the child support statute requires support until 21. I think the issue, first of all, is that I, I mean, I personally like don't I'm not I'm not interested in like relent, like giving up the fact that I believe very strongly that my client has actually been neglected and abused. And that's why the that's why reunification is not viable. The fact that the parent isn't supporting them now at age 19 is not the reason that reunification is not viable. And I will not concede that. You know, I, I hear what you're saying, and I've seen that used by this particular person. No, I, I, I hear you, but I also think there's, I think it's problematic, and I know Stephanie will, will address this, but I think it's problematic for USCIS purposes because, you know, I mean, particularly under New York law, abandonment is not about financial support, right? So, I mean, I get similar basis maybe, but abandonment is not about financial support. Abandonment is about contact. It's about visits. Even if, you know, and, and neglect is not about financial support, right? And you know this. I, I know you're a family court practitioner. I know you know this. But I feel very, very strongly that we cannot allow um, this particular argument to take over and just to accept orders that are about child support because that's not what this is about. Um, I mean, you can do whatever you want as a practitioner, but I know, I, you know, I know we agree. My view that is a positive. Really? really surprised me when you sprung it on me. Well, I know. Uh, oh, you, but anyway. No, I mean, I, I just think that, like, you know, the, we have. Was I too forceful? I'm sorry. No, I, I, I feel actually very agree. Right? About like, things. the. the <laughs> What we have in the TVPRA that defines SIG, like it's really clear, like that, which is why some of these RFEs from immigration are so frustrating. Like the law is like not ambiguous at all, like what needs to be in that finding. It's like a nice short, very, you know, sentence. Like we all know what's there, and our law fits in squarely with what is required under the USC. So I just don't know why we need to try to like fit a square peg in a round hole when we have like a thousand round things to put in that hole. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so you can two more minutes. Are there other questions? Uh, w quickly, do you want to, um, paternity, yeah. Paternity, there's. Who is your donor? I don't know. So there's, there's been some, some cases. <laughs> really excellent at the end of 2016 cases from the appellate division about is, you know, do you have to establish paternity before getting a special finding order? Does a dad have to be on the birth certificate to get a finding against that person? And the answer is no, because the appellate courts recognize that family lives are complicated. Getting people's names on birth certificates can be complicated in that dads can abandon a mother before a child is born. And that all of those things are the reality of family life. And that family life is complicated and that none of that is required. And any requirement of a paternity proceeding is not 
any suggestion that a paternity proceeding should be done before a special finding motion can be made, I think should be vigorously fought. It's not required. I think there's a really strong argument that a straight up paternity proceeding when you're not also seeking support is actually improper under the Family Court Act, that that's not the right vehicle. And the paternity can be established in any number of family mm -hmm. court proceedings. It doesn't just have to be in a paternity proceeding. Yeah, so the three cases, and you know, they're in the case law, but, um, and I think, you know, I actually think Jake, matter of Jake is really important because it is in the TPR context. And I think, again, it's reminding, termination oh, sorry, of parental yes, rights. termination of parental rights. Again, it's just reminding judges that this is not just coming into family court to get an immigration, like get an immigration order. It's about permanency for children. And so these same issues exist across the body of family law. So in a termination of, um, I'm sorry, a TPR case, there was an abandonment found against a dad without officially establishing paternity. That's a really great case to cite because it's not just in the SIG context. Um, Heidi, I don't know how you actually say it, um, 2015, abandonment against dad, not listed on the birth certificate, and T minus, Right, that's where no doubt on birth certificate, yeah. attorney not established. Uh, Karen C is also a case where you know dad abandons before birth, and the second department says yes, that's fine. <laughs> like you don't have to abandon after birth. You don't have to actually, at some point, have a relationship with a child to abandon them. You can abandon a child before you ever meet them. Um, you know, these are all concepts that are actually readily understood in Article 10 proceedings, where there is where there are putative fathers, you know, and other things. But um, suddenly, when it when a sig, when a SIG motion motion is before a judge, some, some I don't know some some of the same judges, often, and I feel really awful. I feel like I'm being disrespectful almost saying this while you're sitting here before me, but because you don't do this, but um, you know, but some judges do seem to feel like it's different, and it's not different. It's yeah. about permanency for families, and which is why I always like to just. I have this like folder that I bring with me with all of the law because the reality is my case is no different than the case that was called before me. It's the same law. It's the same case law. It's mm -hmm. everything is the same, right? Like I might be asking for a different order, right? And maybe I don't want a custody order, order of protection, but the laws are all the same. And that reminding judges that it's not just because this person is an immigrant. Like why, why mm -hmm. are you doing this to my client? You didn't do that to your previous case. I practice in name change court. And we have these same conversations. We're just reminding judges we're in civil court. Civil court is all over the state. There's lots of really great laws. There's really clear rules in the CPLR. And we're all part of the system that functions every day to solve problems. And that this case is not special or unique or deserves like extra judicial requirements just because my client's an immigrant. Mm -hmm.